Life is truly fascinating and the same can be said for the brilliant world of fungi. In today's conversation, we're going to have a guest on that's going to unpack the range of functional mushrooms that are out there, um, including some psychedelic ones. We're going to discuss active molecules that are really key to functional mushrooms in terms of microdosing, looking at the extraction that's really going to support the implementation and use of these products. Further, we're going to look at the history of fungi, predating civilization and humanity, looking at how it really shaped the world and terraformed the planet. We're going to also look at its use with humans and have a look at some of the historic context for that. And finally, we're going to look at the industrial applications, not only currently, but potentially in the future when it relates to fungi and its use on the planet. I hope you enjoyed this discussion and the passionate speaker we have on today. Hi, today I've got on with me uh, Callan Taylor Clark from Aoife Apothecary, who's going to explain a bit about functional mushrooms, its applications, its history. I must say, when I saw your presentation at an expo recently, I really loved the passion and what you were discussing. Um, so today I want to unpack, you know, who exactly is Callan Taylor Clark, and then give us that presentation, because I think the presentation was so good <laughs> that people have to see it, and we're going to digitize it for YouTube today. Awesome, Jeff. Thank you so much for having me, man. I'm so, so excited just to speak to your audience and get people excited about mushrooms. I think that's our biggest goal is to get people excited about the natural world. Absolutely. So can you give me a sort of synopsis? What got you into going into functional mushrooms? Because it's not everyone who's interested in mycelium. So seeing someone yeah. interested in mycelium, in mycology, you know, it's, it's yeah. always a fascinating science. So give us a bit of background. It's, a, it's, it's actually quite an interesting story. I, I tried to push off mushrooms for a long time. I was like, no, nah, I don't want anything to do with them. And I was like, I'm focused on herbs and focused on plants. And they just kept like inching their way into my life. And, you know, after I moved um, out of corporates, I, I left the corporate world. I needed to do something. And the, the natural world and herbal medicine just like sprung up and it just did phenomenally. And our business has been going really, really well. But mushrooms in particular only came into my life when I moved to the Eastern Cape, where we're currently based, uh, in a wonderful little village called Haga Haga. And after being out in the forests and actually harvesting mushrooms and getting down and dirty, crawling on my belly through the forest, only then did they actually like start to click inside of my mind. And like, this is an amazing subject, a field that no one knows about, um, things that uh, we're, we're discovering on a daily basis. And, you know, this, this field of mycology is so new that we can all just make this amazing mark on the industry. So myself, I'm, I'm, I do many, many different things. Um, I'm one of the co-founders of Ether. Uh, I'm an ethnomycologist. I study fungi, which we'll talk about in the, in the presentation. Um, I'm a serial entrepreneur. I do many, many different things, but uh, fungi right up there at the top of the list, right next to surfing and banana bread. <laughs> awesome. So with that, let's have you actually share the presentation so we can get kicking into actually the discussion. Wonderful, man. Well, I'm so excited to be presenting to you because I love this presentation. I've done it many, many, many times all around the country. Um, so I, I know my stuff and I'm really excited for you to, to see about fungi and to learn about fungi. So very simply, this presentation we've called The Brilliance of Fungi because it's it's such a vast presentation. It covers the history uh, to the medicinal benefits to the, the industry and where we're going currently. So um, yeah, I, I'm really hoping you're going to enjoy it. It's a fun one. But maybe before we get started, I just wanted to tell you about our company. So what we do, who we are. So our company is called Ether Apothecary. And we started about five, six years ago. And uh, we very simply are herbal med medicine manufacturers. We make some really kick-ass medicines. Uh, we're now in over 80 stores around the country. We stock up doctor's rooms and pharmacies um with various different herbal medicines but we specialize in medicinal mushrooms that's really what we focus on um and as you can see behind me we make many different types of medicines all using laboratory extracted technologies so we use what's called subcritical extraction so it's uh, really marrying traditional knowledge ancient knowledge with modern up-to-date science and that's that's really what we're trying to do we're trying to get people um confidence in herbal medicine again make them uh, see the brilliance of it and yeah that's basically what we do uh, a lot of our stuff is centered around traditional medicines in south africa but we do provide medicines from all over the country so in this presentation i'm just going to pull this over here slightly we're going to cover four different main topics so it's going to be the the history the life cycle and a little bit of the science around fungi just so that we can better understand fungi a little bit better we're going to also jump into fungi and how they can save our world because this is an interesting topic it's like 
how can fungi actually help us on a day-to-day um, basis? And then third, a little bit of a secret, which a lot of people don't know about. It's something that I've been doing for the last four years. So if we've got time, I'm going to jump into that as well. And then we'll open up for some questions. So let's quickly go like this. So a little bit of the history. So this is a fun story to tell. It's a story that doesn't really get told and it's something that we don't learn in school. So a lot of this is actually left out of our textbooks and hopefully soon it will start to make its way into the textbook. So um, I'm gonna paint this picture for you. I want you to, to imagine this for me. Imagine the world back millions and billions of years ago when it was just a rock, when it was a solid clump of mass, not much going on on, the, on this planet. Right at the beginning when there was just water and rock, and some basic organisms, fungi and bacteria ruled the roost. They were living in the water and uh, they were basically just getting on with their day-to-day -day lives. Now, we know that fungi were some of the first organisms back about 2.4 billion years ago that started to actually develop into complex networks. So we know this because of a fossilized remains that was discovered off of the Western Cape, right in South Africa, uh, called the, um, uh, the Onkeluk Formation. And what this shows us, as you can see in this little image over here, is um, a mycelial web, an early mycelial web that was interwoven, uh, that remained basically the same structural components as it does today back 2.4 billion years ago so fungi basically started to learn how to develop their structures and they've run with that since uh, since then all the way to today so imagine this rock we've got fungi and they start to leap up out of the ocean and they start to come onto dry land back before plants and mammals ever did now the wonderful thing for us is that fungi did this because when they came onto dry land, they actually needed to get a food source. They needed to start uh, digesting food. And this is great for us because they pop mark themselves onto rocks. They attach themselves onto rocks and broke down the rock into uh, different forms like calcium. Uh, and they actually started to make our first soils that we see today. Uh, fungi and bacteria mainly played this role. So without fungi and bacteria, we wouldn't have our soils that plants could grow out of today. So this was many, many billions of years ago. If we progress in time a little bit, we start to see that fungi, again, are ruling the roost. They're pretty much planet-wide. Uh, they're growing to enormous, enormous uh, statues like uh, this fungus over here which is a fossilized remains of a species called prototaxites and the species could grow up to six meters tall so large huge fungi uh, and they littered the landscape um, pretty much dwarfed anything else in, in on the planet at that point in time this is about 350 million years ago so fungi are the main organisms on this planet uh, now something really interesting happens about a hundred million years ago we start to see fungi go from large, large structures down and actually find their niches, get much smaller, and they start to find uh, their little avenues that they can live. Plants start to get bigger. We start to see trees come about, um, mammals come onto the, onto the planet, but fungi get smaller. And this is very cool because we've got this fossilized remain that was found here off Brazil in the Crato Formation. About 150 million years ago, this fungi, fungus was preserved. And what this shows us over here on this right-hand side is that fungi 150 million years ago developed their stipe and their cap. Over 115 million years ago, they figured out their reproductive model and they've stuck with it today, still today, which shows incredible intelligence. It shows that um, they pretty much figured it out and they don't need to change it. Uh, so well, fungi... I'm going to jump in there because that's so interesting. I mean, we look at the, the context of evolution of microorganisms. I mean, we've adapted to the bacteria and fungi around us as a, as a homo sapien. And it's amazing. People always overlook the fact that there's more microorganisms in the human body than there is human cells. Yeah. Uh, and just because yeah. they're not as big, uh, doesn't mean that they're not as populous. Uh, and the fact that something like that morphology of, you know, the cap and the, and, and the stem is like uh, that that's been established and has not changed for over a hundred exactly. million years is incredible. I mean, it's almost it like shows, it hit its pinnacle of evolution and it's sticking to it know. in the modern age. It shows, it shows some awesome intelligence, really, really profound intelligence, uh, that millions of years ago could figure it out. So they've held their shape. And they pretty much like dispersed throughout the planet. Um, a lot of people don't know is that fungi um, outnumber all uh, plants and mammals. Uh, the the genus of fungi in, in general, the the whole family outnumber all plants and mammals, which is incredible. So there's many different varieties. Um, 
if we do progress a little bit in the timeline, so we're going to go from that 150 million years ago to about 300,000 years ago. And um, I don't know what you feel. I, I love South Africa. I love this place. I think it's a wonderful, wonderful place, magical place. It's the cradle of humankind. And what that, what's wonderful about that is that we can, from South Africa, we can track the migratory patterns of human beings up all the way through Africa, into Europe, across Europe, into Asia, across the Bering Strait. Some people went down into Australasia, et cetera, et cetera. What we see about 100,000 to 300,000 years ago is that all the way along this migratory pattern, um, we start to see fungal depictions pop up in cave art, um, uh, some fossilized remains as well. This basically shows us that human beings have come in contact with fungi many thousands of years ago. It doesn't quite show that we uh, consumed fungi or used fungi, but it does show that we came in contact with them. And this is very interesting because human beings have been with fungi for many, many thousands of years. Our first depiction of real world use comes about 19,000 years ago. Now this jawbone over here is a fossilized remain of a elderly woman that was found in a cave in Almiron in, um, in Spain. And this is a very interesting uh, uh, fossilized record because it actually shows us the first, actual first use or earliest use of fungi that we've got today. So this is about 19,000 years old. And what it shows us um, is that humans we're either consuming fungi or using them medicinally because in a dental enamel, two isotopes, two spore isotopes were discovered. I don't know if you want to take some guesses as to what they were, but no, um, go for it. <laughs> the, the one is an amazing mushroom called the Belitis mushroom. I don't know if you've ever heard of it before. It's, it's a I've delicious heard of it, yeah. Thing. yeah. It's really, it's, it's phenomenal eating. And the other one is a species called Amanita muscaria, this red mushroom with the little white specks on it. A lot of people know it's very famous um, psychoactive fungus, uh, a lot of shamanic use around it. Now, this was found in her dental enamel just before she died. So she consumed these fungi just before she died, maybe as food or maybe just before her death to help her transition in death. Uh, this Amanita muscari mushroom could have been used like it's being used today, like the psychoactive fungi being used today to help with um, crossing over and death. Um, so it doesn't give us hard evidence what they were using it for, but we do know that humans 19,000 years ago were using fungi. This is very, very exciting for me because um, it shows that our people have been using fungi, but we've sort of lost this, this ability, this, this use. Um, hopefully we can get back there. So if we progress a little bit more in the timeline, we start to see more drawings pop up. This is the mushroom shaman in Algeria in Sicily. Uh, this is about six to 7,000 years old. We start to see the Mayans and the Aztecs depict fungi and some of their most sacred deities like Tiran and the cattle. Is depicted as a fungus. Tiona nanakatl means flesh of the gods, and they would consume this in order to connect with the divine. Uh, we start to see a lot of depictions all around the world, mainly around these three species: the Psilocybe, or the, these three families: the Psilocybe genus, Penelis genus, and the Amanita genus. Psilocybe worldwide, Penelis more southern. We get a lot of them in South Africa, and then Amanitas in the more northern territories in Siberia, Europe, that sort of area. But all of these are revolving around um, psychoactive use. So we see cultures start to pop up all around the world, like the ancient Greeks, Persephone and Demeter, um, over here depicted holding up fungi. It's an actual, um, an amazing story of the Elysian Mysteries. I don't know if you've ever heard of the Elysian Mysteries before. No, no, elaborate if you want to, go ahead. Okay, so every single um, ancient mathematician, philosopher, um, all of our forefathers of democracy, so Plato and Hippocrates and Dioscorides, had to go through to these Elysian mysteries in order to basically um, uh, become acclaimed and to, to, to start their trade. And at these mysteries, at these, this festival that would happen, it turns out now through research, scientific research that was done. There's an amazing, amazing book that came out called The Immortality Key by Brian Murescu that goes into detail on this. At these mysteries, they would consume a beverage called the Kaikion. And this Kaikion um, has now been proven to contain ergo, 
And if you know anything about fungi, ergo is what Albert Hoffman synthesized LSD from. So our ancient forefathers of democracy were consuming LSD beverages at uh, at these festivals. We, we see the Vedic tribes, like uh, the Hindu people worshipping Soma, uh, the Colombian art um, uh, revolves around fungi, even Siberian artworks revolve around fungi. It may trouble some people to see, but even Christian iconography all around the world showcasing fungi. Uh, I don't usually go too much in depth over here because it does upset a few people, but there's some books that people can check out if they do want to learn about it. Um, all around the world, we see iconography pop up, um, but it's not really what we do at our company. So what we mainly focus on is the um, the medicinal use of fungi. And now we do have depictions of medicinal use worldwide. We've got the Kerala people um, in India, uh, the North American shamans, the Nazi people of uh, Siberia, all using fungi for different reasons in order to combat ailments or get rid of insects or help with cancers. But the earliest depiction that we have of medicinal use comes from this crazy cat over here. This is Otzi the Iceman. Now, Otzi's gained some amazing, amazing popularity. Um, most people have heard of his story, but I'm going to reiterate it here because it's a very interesting story. It's a wonderful one. So this, this guy over here is called Otzi. And Otzi is a Bronze Age man that was living near the Otzal Alps. And just before his death, Otzi was running for his life. I know that sounds terrible, but he was running for his life. And he made his way up into the mountains. And we knew he was running for his life because he had a, uh, an arrow wound in his shoulder. Someone was shooting an arrow at him. So he was running for his life. And up in the mountains, as he got up there, he fell through a crevice. And as he fell through this crevice, uh, he landed and he was perfectly preserved. He was encased in ice and perfectly preserved for, I think it's what, 5,000 years now, which is extraordinary because we can now analyze Otsi and see exactly what afflictions he had, what he ate that morning, um, his uh, general health and well-being. This is incredible for science. It's uh, not really good for Otsi. It sucks for Otsi. <laughs> too bad. But for us, it's amazing. Now, of particular interest to me and to various uh, mycologists all around the world is that Otsi um, had, a, had an affliction. He had a parasitic tapeworm in his gut. Now... Otzi also carried two different fungi on his person. We see this uh, number 20 over here. This is the chaga mushroom. Now, chaga is very interesting because uh, you can actually crack chaga open and you can put an ember inside of it and carry, you can close it up and carry that ember for three or four days without it going out wow. and restart it somewhere else. So that shows immediately great intelligence from our early um, Bronze Age ancestors. But the one that's more interesting to me is this fungus over here, number 12. This is the birch polypore. Now, the birch polypore is a phenomenally medicinal mushroom. And do you know what it kills? Do you know what it uh, it, it can fully take care of? I'm assuming it's a Parasitic tapeworm, <laughs> exactly. So Otzi knew exactly what affliction he had, and he knew exactly how to treat it. The only terrible thing was that Otzi didn't take his medicine in time. And if you know anything about... Um, about uh, antibiotics, you need to finish your course of medicine, otherwise it doesn't work. So Otzi unfortunately didn't finish his course, but it shows us that he did know what he was taking and why he was taking it. So our early ancestors were utilizing fungi on so a regular I basis. I want to jump in there because you mentioned two things. Uh, you mentioned chaga, obviously. Now I've heard before that people refer to it as a mushroom, what more mark like mycelium, because it's, you know, yeah. like, so let's discuss that, that debate. Chaga. And then you also mentioned polypore. Uh, where I think we sure. also should maybe, because reishi is a, po a common one there. What's the difference yeah. between a polypore and the gills that normally fall under, form underneath a mushroom? Okay, so Jeff, I, I'm going to um, bug you with this one. I've got a whole section on polypores. Okay. So I'm going to keep you in suspense for okay. like cool. 10 more months, and then we're going to get into it. You're going to love it, trust me. But I will answer this question. So chaga is an amazing mushroom. Uh, well, an amazing fungus. The chaga that we harvest, a lot of people don't know, it's actually not the, that's not the reproductive organ. They call it a sclerotia. It's actually a clump of mycelium. The mycelium, uh, there's basically a wound in the tree, an opening. And in order to seal that up, like bees seal up um, their hives with propolis, the fungus will do that as well. It will clump up mycelium and make this hard structure in order to protect it from the outside world. That's exactly what chaga is. Um, so, yeah, let's quickly move on here. Um, 
some of the other ancient uh, people that utilize mushrooms, a lot of the research comes from the East, um, mainly from this book. This was one of the first books that were written. This is the Shen Nong. And the Shen Nong um, is a phenomenal uh, pharmacopoeia manuscript that was written by the mythical first creator of China, Shen Nong. Uh, and um, this highlights various, various uh, different uh, minerals and herbs and barks and leaves that you can utilize to combat ailments. And right at the top of this list of these um, superior tonics, fungi, were right at the top there, reishi and cordyceps and lion's mane. So we know that the ancient Asians utilized fungi. They revered them, even their... A lot of their religion revolves around it. So we've got Peng Zhu over here holding a reishi fungus. Uh, we've got the Buddhai, the, the laughing Buddha. Uh, he would carry reishi mushrooms around with him. And in exchange for food, he would give people reishi mushrooms. He has his basket full of reishi mushrooms. Um, so what does that show us? It basically shows us that humans have used fungi. For, for many, many thousands of years, but we've lost this a little bit. We've uh, we've strayed a little bit too far. And I'm hoping that through our company and through many, many other people doing this work, people can get back to the to the awesome, awesome world of um, of medicinal mushrooms. And we can start utilizing them like our ancestors did because uh, they're really phenomenal, really strong. And I'm going to show you how strong they are in a second. So let's get into your question about the different gills, the different types of fungi, because it's always fun to know I don't know if you ever go into the forest. Do you ever go and harvest mushrooms? Not as much as I would like to, no. So occasionally yeah. I've been yeah. out, but uh, very rare actually. Okay, so this is a this is a basic overview. It will help you understand just a little bit more about what you're looking at and the different reproductive cycles of them. So scientists love to classify. It's one of their favorite things to do. So we're going to classify here a little bit. So there's four main groups of fungi. So we've got phycomycetes. These are the lower fungi. So phycomycetes uh, are things like molds, like bread molds, rhizopus over here. Uh, I don't, we don't really focus on them too much. Uh, they, they're great, but they're not really what we look at. There's ascomycetes. These are sac fungi. So uh, have you ever heard of a truffle? You know, truffles. So truffles fall into this category. Instead of making spores and dispersing them out with the wind, they enclose their spores into a sac. And something needs to break open that sack to get the spores out. So yeasts fall into this, um, truffles and different puffballs, even cordyceps fall into this category over here. They encase their spores. It's a great, great uh, family. A lot of the mushrooms that we use medicinally fall into this, but the main one is Basidiomycetes or Basidiomycota. Uh, this is the largest family. This is the ones that uh, produce uh club fungi fruiting bodies you know the things you see coming out of the ground or out of the tree uh this is that main category and then there's also deuteromycetes so deuteromycetes fungi like uh, uh scientists love to classify and if they can't find a classification a group to put it in they put it into this group of yeah fungi imperfecti they call it until they figure out where to put it at a later stage they'll just keep it in this group over here so a little bit of the life cycle. So we're going to look at that um, the pseudomycetes, the ones that produce fruiting bodies, because that fruiting body, that thing we see coming out of the ground, isn't the, it's not all of the fungus. There's actually a lot more going on. And a lot of people are quite surprised when they hear this. The fruiting body is actually just the reproductive organ. So I'm going to break this down here and we can, we can go into depth because it's a very interesting topic. So this, um, this cap, this stipe that we see here, is basically the start and the end. So which came first, the chicken or the egg? I don't know, I'm not too sure, but we're gonna start off maybe with the chicken over here. So um, the fruiting body is the reproductive organ and the point of the reproductive organ is to make spores so that it can reproduce, very simple. So what it does is if the conditions are just right and wind is coming, uh, spores will dislodge from the gills. They'll get blown off into an environment They'll fly hundreds of kilometers sometimes and land on, on a hospitable environment. So be that soil or bark or wood, whatever it grows on, whatever it eats, depending on what type of fungus it is. Um, when it lands on this hospitable environment, the spore will germinate, a single spore. Now, a single spore only has 50% of the genetic material needed. So it needs to find a mate. So what it does is it goes onto Tinder and it goes and searches. <laughs> And hopefully there's another spore nearby and that spore will germinate as well and they'll link up and they'll find each other. 
And if everything goes good and they like each other, they'll just expand and basically genetic material will just take over and they'll just start to proliferate. So now when they germinate, it only is only one hyphae, one single strand. But when they have all the genetic material needed, they can produce millions and billions of hyphal threads that go out and into an environment. Now we call this hyphal thread, uh, this interlocking of hyphal threads mycelium. I'm sure you've heard of that term before. Yeah. It's a very common term. Everyone talks about it. So mycelium is only one syllable thick. It's very, very thin. And uh, it is hugely intelligent. So intelligent that it will blow your mind. So to give you an example, the point of mycelium is to go out and into, into an environment and search for food. That's its main, its main point. It needs to find food and eat. It's very hungry. So it goes out and it searches and it's searching millions of different points. And when it discovers a food source, when a high full tip, when one of those high feet discovers a food source, something very interesting will happen. If it's never found this food source before, it will code for new DNA sequences and make a metabolite to digest that food source. And it will do this thousands of times a day, finding new food sources and making a whole new metabolite, recoding its DNA to make a whole new metabolite to digest this food source. And this is so interesting because it can eat pretty much anything that has hydrocarbons in it, anything that is made up of nature. It can just consume, which is basically everything. Now we're seeing some really amazing things happening here. Like I've got where I live, it's a, a nature conservancy. And in order to try and preserve nature, you know, humans, we think we know what we're doing. We paint uh, a lot of the conservancy members painted on this um, anti, what, what do you call it? Um, uh, like a, a herbicide onto black wattles to try and get rid of the black wattles, which is an admirable thing to do. However, there's a whole slew of issues that come along with that leaching into the system. We don't really want that herbicide in the system. So what I've actually discovered is, and this was just by chance, I was walking and I discovered these fungi growing on this, uh, this black wattle stump that was painted with this herbicide called kaput. And what started to happen is the fungus went into this tree trunk found this herbicide and decided it was delicious and was going to eat it. So it started coding new DNA for eating this herbicide like it's not an issue at all and just has now dissolved that whole tree into nothing. Where nothing else could grow, this fungus could grow and uh, digest this food source. It's very, very cool. And um, what will happen if it gets enough food, if it eats enough, um, it will then start to um, clump up mycelium. And if the conditions are just right, it will start to make a new fruiting body. So it will start with this uh, pin going into a button and that button will eventually cap out if there's enough humidity and moisture in the air, the whole process will start again. So hugely intelligent. Um, it's, a, it's a phenomenal system that was figured out 115 million years ago, which you spoke about earlier, and it's kept that whole system to this day, which is very cool. Um, so yeah, there's two different types of mycelium. There's um, rhizomorphic mycelium, which is the main ones that we see like out in the forest. It's mycelium jumping, looking for, for food. And then when it's ready to, to grow a mushroom, it will start to become tormentos like this. It will start to pack on itself. Awesome. So I want to mention, I mean, it's it's fascinating and it fully, I mean, I've seen the, the research around, you know, the ability of fungi to start degrading plastics, remediate yeah. certain, uh, you know, rubbers, pollution. It's actually really fascinating. And it's also awesome. really fascinating because anyone who studied mycology at university would have also learned how, you know, fungus sets traps for insects, how they, you know, slowly start to go through the body and eat the organs that yeah. are the least essential. So like, it's amazing yeah. how, how it can actually, I think it's with wasps where they actually start yeah. to degradate the organs that the wasp least yeah, needs and then leaves the yeah. most vital organs for last, which is just crazy intelligence when people right. think of the context of how smart fungus really can be in that sense. So it's so much smarter than we ever knew. So those yeah. species are called entomopathogenic fungi. They actually eat insects, they parasite insects, and it's hugely, hugely cool. I love, love that subject. Um, even other examples, I mean, we're, we're starting to see avenues for fungal use all over. Um, and that's why I'm so excited about the the one section on um, on fungi and how they can help us, because there's so many different avenues that we could look into. Even that entomopathogenic fungal use for insects, um, keeping them in check, which is very cool. Cool. 
there are those that reproductive cycle there's many different um many different types of fruiting bodies that can get developed so we see some sac fungi like truffles we've got um earth stars and um different bracket fungi club fungi we've got morels various different types coral fungi all utilizing pretty much the same model just with slight variations and there's many many different types of morphologies that can happen there but if we break that uh, that category down even further so we've got those four different types if we just look at um basidomycota basidomycetes we can break that down even more into four different types so we've got mycorrhizal fungi now mycorrhizal fungi are very cool they've gained a lot of popularity recently um, thanks to books like um, Entangled Life by Merlin Sheldrake, showcasing the intelligence of fungi. So mycorrhizal, if we break that word down, myco meaning fungus and rhizal meaning root. So these fungi, um, they go down and they implant themselves into the soil, not looking for food, but looking for tree roots. Not looking to kill them, but looking to bond with them. So they go down and they're either endomycorrhizal, which... Um, means that they go into the into the tree roots they break through the cell wall of the tree roots and they actually fuse with the tree roots or ectomycorrhizal meaning they make like a net called a hearting net around the tree roots and the point of this is to shuffle nutrients from tree to tree so they they work with trees to shuffle nutrients to shuffle um water and minerals and in exchange, they get sugars from the tree. So it's a, it's, a, it's a give and take. They also do a lot of other things, which we'll discuss in a second. So there's also saprophytic fungi. So often when we see fungi growing on trees, we get quite scared and we're like, oh, no, it's killing the tree. It's not usually the case. Most of the fungi that we see growing on trees are saprophytic, meaning that they break down the tree. They eat the lignin and cellulose. So they're the, bi they're the primary decomposers of um of the natural world so they they digest and rot down the tree and break it down so that other organisms can use it so most of our medicinal fungi fall into this category saprophytes now there are fungi that do kill trees so parasitic fungi um now this is quite an interesting one so parasitic comes from the word parasitos and parasitos actually means to eat from someone else's table um, which i think perfectly su sums up what these fungi do they go and eat the tree they eat the tree's life force they they break it down so instead of um di digesting a tree that's already dead or dying like saprophytes do they actually go in and kill the tree now this can be uh, beneficial um we don't have to think of this as a negative thing this can be great and then lastly symbiotic fungi so things like lichens uh this is very cool because up until now we thought that uh symbiotic fungi were just two organisms a fungus and an algae the point of the fungus is to become scaffolding and hold onto like a, a tree and the point of the algae is to photosynthesize and give sugars to the fungus now what we do know now is that the symbiotic fungus or the symbiotic um, organism is actually a blend of thousands of different organisms different fungi and bacteria all living in harmony and making an ecosystem that keeps predators at bay it's very very cool um now these again can be broken down into guild fungi guild of the main ones that we see these are the the um agaricus bisporus the little button mushrooms that we buy at Woolworths. uh most fungi that we know of have gills uh, this is just because we don't really go into the forest and go and look. But if you actually go into the forest, you can see many different variants. So polypores, which we spoke about earlier, these are very cool. Um, I think I have got some here, but I'll just show you. So um, polypores are very cool because instead of gills, they have little tubes that go up into the cap. Thousands, even millions sometimes of these little tiny tubes. And each tube can hold millions of spores um and then when the conditions are right these spores all drop out and you get billions upon billions of spores going out into environments uh there are some other variations there's uh, ridges so ridges are also quite cool um they make their spores and those spores are dispersed when they're agitated so either wind blowing on them and agitating it or an animal coming past and ruffling it the spores will go into the animal and the animal will carry it away and then lastly teeth teeth are a good combination of ridges and pores they do very similar work um yeah, they're, they're basically external pores. And then 
just to showcase like a healthy environment because uh, fungi are hugely necessary for a healthy environment. So we, we need the uh, primary decomposers like the saprophytes and we need the mycorrhizal species to transfer nutrients, even parasitic fungi we need. So to give you an example of parasitic fungi, um, uh, blue gums have become a huge issue in South Africa. We all know blue gum issues. So now what we're starting to see is the influx of a natural competitor to blue gum being the chicken of the woods fungus. Now, before chicken of the woods was here, blue gum was just rampant, it was rife. Now we're starting to see uh, chicken of the woods come in and kill these trees because they're parasitic. They actually start to kill them and degrade them. So we're starting to see this balancing out of nature, which is quite exciting. Yeah. So this next section is my favorite section. I'm going to keep you in suspense here while I have a drink of my tea. <laughs> well, you're getting into the topic I'm interested in is, you know, the idea of beta-glucans, uh, tritopenes. Exactly. So it's going to be really interesting to hear about the functional aspects uh, of the molecules. Sure. So this is also my favorite subject. It's the subject that I've uh, put a lot of research into. I'm always reading medical papers and research journals, trying to see what the best extraction protocols are. And I think we've sort of figured it out. So I'm going to break down the cell a little bit more so that people can understand them. So it's very simple. I mean, this is a fungal cell. Obviously, this uh, cell wall goes all around in a circle, but we're just looking at one quarter of it. So the cell of a fungus, it pretty much looks quite similar throughout different fungi. They generally made up, the cell wall is made up of long chain sugars called polysaccharides. And these polysaccharides are bind, bound together with a chemical called chitin. Now, chitin is the same chemical that makes up the exoskeleton of insects and crustaceans. It's a very strong binding molecule. So we need to break that apart in order to access those beta-glucans, those, those long-chain sugars, the interior um, uh, compounds like a gostrel and uh, some triterpenoids and stuff like that. So I'm going to try and break it down into three different categories. So polysaccharides being primary metabolites, and we've got triterpenes being secondary metabolites and then marker compounds, which are also necessary. Um, and they have some huge medicinal benefits. So let's maybe go into polysaccharides. Yeah. So polysaccharides are very cool molecules. Now, most fungi have polysaccharides. I, I think almost every single fungus has polysaccharides. Let me, let me correct myself on that. So polysaccharides are very simply long chain sugars that are bound together. They're bound together, it's beta-glucans that are bound together. Now, not all beta-glucans are the same. So most food so, uh, substances have beta-glucans in them. So if we just take oats, for instance, over here, oats do have beta-glucans, but where the binding happens is on the 1314 um, section. This is um, a phenomenal food source, but medicinally doesn't have much benefit. So 1314, not my favorite. Whereas if we look at fungi, Fungi have 1316 binding. It's a much better number. It's much cooler. It's 1316. It's a better number. <laughs> um, but it makes it makes the world of difference. That that binding allows for some really interesting things to happen. We start to see tremendous um uh immunostimulation happening, immunomodul immunomodulatory effects um from polysaccharides, from these beta glucans. That's mainly what these these primary metabolites are for. So to give you an example of how they work, we need to look at the adaptive immune system. So the innate immune system is our primary defensive system. It's our skin and our eyelashes and our mucous membranes that keeps organisms out. However, if organisms come into the body, our body needs to be able to react to them and get rid of them quickly. And that's where our adaptive immune system kicks in. So it's a very, I'm going to simplify it here. Um, this is a, a very um, simple process. However, it is much more thorough and you can find this information on our, on our websites, but it starts off with cytokines. Now the point of cytokines are to scan the body, looking for debris and toxins and viruses that have come into the body that aren't supposed to be there. And when they find something, they pull the alarm system and they notify the alarms go off and the body needs to kick into gear. So what happens is if they find a virus, our marrow and our various um, lymphocytes will make firstly B cells. Now the point of B cells is to go and try and destroy that virus, that contaminant. When it finds a virus and it can destroy it, if it's easy enough to kill it, it will make antibodies, antigens, 
and uh, those antibodies will be utilized to kill the, the virus. If the virus is much stronger and it's infected um, the, the various uh, cells inside of the body, T cells will get deployed. Now, T cells are, um, the point of T cells is that they attack our own cells. They attack uh, cells that have become um, inflicted with a virus. If this process doesn't get rid of the virus, then natural killer cells will come in. And the point of natural killer cells is to be like a like a barrage, a storm, a, a, a big bomb, and it doesn't kill, care what it kills in its environment. It will basically kill everything. It will drop like a nuke. That's a terrible example, but it will just kill everything in the environment. Now, that usually does the trick. However, if that hasn't done the trick, then our last point of call, phagocytes um, or macrophages, they've got various different types, will go out. These are our heavy hitters, our bodyguards. And they'll go out and they'll find a virus, um, a foreign contaminant, and they'll basically beat it up and get it um, as, as lackluster as possible and carry it back to B cells so that B cells can know how to kill this virus and B cells will kill the virus, make an antigen, make an antibody, and the whole process will start again because then the body knows how to destroy this virus. Now, the cool thing about mushroom um, beta-glucans, what scientists have found is that these beta-glucans can upregulate various systems in that innate and adaptive, so in that adaptive immune system, they can actually help to um, upregulate macrophage activity so they can help our macrophages um, move quicker, they can help them be more adaptive, uh, produce more macrophages. We see natural killer cell activation. Uh, there's even things that are serious as tumor necrosis factors. So our own body making cancers and viruses, these beta glucans can actually help stimulate natural killer cell and tumor necrosis factor within the body. So these are just some examples of what scientists have now found that beta glucans can actually stimulate within the body. This is not a thorough list. The list just goes on and on and on and on. So for, for upregulating immunity, for helping with, um, uh, um, uh, with balancing out immune systems. So for people with autoimmune diseases, macro, uh, these, um, uh, beta glucans can be hugely beneficial. Now, most fungi have beta glucans. But it gets quite interesting when we start to look at secondary metabolites. Secondary metabolites like tri triterpenoids and peptides are more specialized. This is where we start to see some really interesting things start to take place. So secondary metabolites, first and foremost, um, can only be produced if a fungus or an organism comes in contact with either a, um, a, a competitor a virus of its own, like I'll give you an example, ratio over here produces ganoderic and lucidenic acids, which have been researched for liver degenerative conditions, helping with um, heart health, cancer treatment. These ganoderic and lucidenic acids can only be produced if the fungus is, well, it can only be produced in significant quantities if the fungus is out in the natural world and comes in contact with its own pathogens. Now, the point of this is that the pathogen tries to kill the fungus and the fungus needs to produce its own uh, adaptive immune system. It needs to produce these chemicals to fight for its life. Now, when we ingest these chemicals, um, we get the same response within our body. So reishi is one example. Chaga is another example of secondary metabolites that can only be produced if environmental factors are, um, are present. So Chaga, the Inonotus oblicus mushroom, grows in the northern territories, so like Siberia and Europe, and it grows mainly on birch trees. Now, um, an interesting chemical in birch trees is um, betulinic acid. And sorry, betulin. Now, chaga, when chaga grows on birch trees, it converts this betulin into betulinic acid, which it can utilize. And betulinic acid is what the main studies around chaga, chaga's medicinal benefits have been done on. So if it isn't grown on birch, it cannot have this chemical. It has zero, absolutely zero amounts of this chemical present. So secondary metabolites are necessary. Um, so when we're looking at, at medicines, which we'll touch on in a second, we need to know where it's grown, why it's grown, um, and uh, if these chemicals are present. So there's a lot of research at the moment going into standardization. We're doing some research um, at the moment with the University of the Free States, as well as some other 
uh, companies on standardizing the mushroom industry in South Africa, because if we're buying a ratio, a chugger product, we want to make sure that these chemicals are present in significant quantities. So these triterpenes are, are very varied. Um, we'll touch on some of them in a second, but they mainly are the more specialized chemicals within fungi, things that can only be found in certain fungi. So reishi and its ganoderic and lucidanic acids, chaga, for instance, lion's mane has its own, cordyceps has its own. And then lastly, we get marker compounds. Now, marker compounds were first developed um, for the grain industry. And they were developed in order to try and figure out if fungi were present in grains, because you don't really want fungi in your in your grains and your in your rice and your barley. So we started to look for things that could ident that could notify us that fungi fungi were present. Now, what we've now figured out is that these marker compounds on their own are actually medicinal as well. So like things like adenosine over here. Uh, is structurally identical to serotonin and it can actually lock into serotonin receptors and help modulate serotonin levels. Um, agostrol is um, structurally identical to cholesterol. However, it does the opposite. It actually drops our cholesterol levels. Um, so these are just some examples of nucleosides and marker compounds that can be utilized you guys, if you do want some more information, I've got a book we've, which I'll touch on in a second. We've written many, many different books uh, that we provide free of charge on our website that you can just download and you can read much more into the scientific literature. So I want to touch uh, on this point quickly because I mean, adenosine is obviously, if you think of ATP in the body, you know, that's the energy side. I mean, it makes me think of uh, what's that one athlete's mushroom? Uh, the uh, the corda. Yes, go ahead. Yeah, cord yes, exactly. exactly. Yeah. So, uh, so adenosine. Um, Yes, adenosine triphosphate uh, cordyceps can actually stimulate adenosine triphosphate's uh, contents in the body. So yeah, phenomenal. Um, cordyceps is one of our absolute favorites for that. Um, I'm going to touch on some of these mushrooms. Maybe our three like favorite mushrooms because they they're like the biggest. Um, the biggest selling mushrooms at the moment, most people know about them, uh, but they don't quite know the actual benefits of them. So we're going to go into like reishi, lion's mane, and cordyceps. Awesome. They're, they're the, the holy grail, the, the big three. <laughs> have you have you tried reishi before? You have I have, reishi? yeah, as an extracted powder. So uh, maybe also Indeed. explain like why are they often extracted because of the bitterness, you know, like, you know, some people don't consume it or do they boil it in water? When is it water soluble, ethanol soluble? Like that's also quite okay. interesting. Yeah. yeah. Well, let's we touch on that before before I get into the different mushrooms. So, um, extraction is hugely beneficial. That cell wall that we looked at, that that fungal cell, that binding of chitin, yeah. is so strong that our guts actually cannot break it down. So we've got these um, these things in our long intestines called Peyer's patches. And the point of a Peyer's patch is to upregulate compounds and uh, disperse them to our various cells in the body. Most of our macrophages sit at the Peyer's patches ready to take them. So for our immune system, um, we need compounds that are small enough that can pass through these pairs pay patches and can be upregulated into the body. So first and foremost, the fungal cell needs to be broken apart in order to access the compounds within it. If we just in ingest it, if we just eat a raw mushroom like reishi, we're not going to get any of the benefits. We're going to get absolutely zero. You might get some fiber, you might get a little bit of protein, but nothing, not much in terms of triterpenes excuse me, and polysaccharides, it's just not going to happen. And various, various, various uh, research papers have been written about this. So when it comes to extraction, we need to extract the fungus in order to make it bioavailable so that we yeah. can use it. It also improves the taste. It improves a few other things. We can also concentrate. We can make things stronger by pr putting more into a smaller amount. And I believe uh, that chitin also causes nausea. So that's another practical reason yeah. to, to kind of do an extraction, make it more bioavailable. And really focusing exactly. on the specific compounds. Exactly. And at, at the end of the day, if you're going to be spending your money on a mushroom supplement, you want to make sure that that mushroom supplement is going to give you the benefits that it's touted to give. Mm. Uh, and it's just going to pass through the body. There are some other things that we can speak about in terms of the difference between um, the different products on the market currently, uh, being myceliated products and fruiting body products. 
Um, this is also a very interesting subject. I don't know if you know much about the the debate on freezing body and. My, well, I, I'm uh, sure we're going to want to hear about that. So I included there at the end as well because I think it is a good one to unpack. Because, like you said, right. I mean, uh, same thing goes with specifically sugar. If it's not grown on birch, you don't get the benefits. So even though it's advertised as being that, you don't actually get no. the active compound, which is exactly what I think the, you know helps to discern. For anyone who's looking yeah. to get into microdosing, to get into you know consuming these uh, these beneficial uh, supplements, like yeah. let's let's educate them. And I think you're doing a great job so far. Awesome, awesome, awesome. Do you want me to do it now? Or should I? Yeah, go go ahead, do just... it now, and then we'll get into the ratio mushroom and the rest of the categories. Okay. So yeah, a big a big uh, factor when it comes to looking at medicinal mushrooms and something that isn't done at the moment in South Africa is the regulation around the actual product that you're you're taking, um, because there is a lot of misconception around the differences in the uh, the different um, growth cycles of the fungus. So. For all of time, since the since the start of humankind up until very recently, human beings utilized fruiting body, the reproductive organ of the fungus for medicine. And this is what all of the ancient history has been around. Uh, and as well as a lot of the scientific literature that's been written is on fruiting body. However, something quite interesting has happened recently in order to... Um, I actually don't know the full reason because I don't want to speculate here, but there are various factors involved, cost saving, um, uh, uh, quick growth and uh, access to market. This practice of growing myceliated grain so that that mycelium that's looking for the food that we spoke about um, is also medicinal, has medicinal capabilities. However, it needs to be grown on something and needs a food source in order to grow. So. Um, usually what's happened is that fungus that mycelium is grown on a grain like rice or sorghum and it grows through this grain and because it's one cell wall thick it can grow and it's very uh, thin and very light and it grows through the grain eating the grain um, and when it's finished this process when it's grown enough when it's filled out the grain this new practice of taking that that jar of myceliated grain and grinding it up and selling that as a health supplement has emerged. Now, don't get me wrong, mycelium can be beneficial. However, by grinding up all of that mycelium and grain, you're actually getting about 70 to 80% starch, just mm. grain in your product. Uh, less, less than 30% is actual mycelium. So mycelium on its own has um, less concentrations of medicinal uh, uh, compounds as to fruiting body per gram. So this this research has been done. So immediately it's got less than fruiting body. Now, if we go on grain, you're only getting 30% of my slim, which means that it drops down even lower. So a lot of people aren't aware of this. When they buy a product in the market, they might see a capsule and they take this capsule and it doesn't do much for them. And the issue with this is that it's because it doesn't have as much fungal um, material in it. Now, there, are, there is some research around the, um, the rice becoming bioavailable and doing certain things. But above all, the research that's been conducted, uh, the um, medical papers and journals that have been written and the benefits that have been seen, for the most part, over 90% of it, is done on fruiting body. So we just need to be aware of the products that we're buying in the market. If it's grown on grain, the wonderful thing about grain and growing my slim on grain is you can churn out a product in less than two weeks, whereas to grow an actual reishi mushroom takes about a year. So it's a much quicker process. Uh, it's cheaper. So I don't quite know the reason of why the product has those products have emerged so heavily into the markets, but we can only speculate. Um, so just for consumers to be aware of, we're trying to look at regulations in the market at the moment to try and get people to know exactly how many beta glucans are in their product. So instead of um, uh, buying a product you, uh, that says ratio, you would look at the product that says ratio and it says 40% beta glucans. And then yes. you know exactly what's that. You know, so then you you know what you're getting. So that's what we're trying to work on. No, that's a, that's a good point. And I think this is exactly that. Like, are you taking that product to an HPLC, checking for what alkaloids, what what beta glucans are in it? Like, and I think it's good terminology because it is somewhat lazy to kind of use something like reishi, but then they're not milling the fruiting bodies. 
but they're just actually milling and, and harvesting the mycelium running through the grain like you said your 70 percent is already grain so now your, your product standards drop and therefore consumers have a bit of a bias against it saying it didn't quite do what i suspected it would and and, and i love that idea and i like the idea of extractions as well because even if it's fruiting bodies, once it's entrapped within the chitin, like the bioavailability is really what we should be focusing on, which is yeah. like what active yeah. molecule and how bioavailable. And I do, I yeah. support that. I'm hoping, hopefully we'll see better label claims and specifications, yeah. but a lot of that is yeah. driven by like a more mature consumer. And I think you're doing an awesome job of explaining this now in this video, because it really unpacks what to look out for when you are specifically yeah. looking to shop online or you go to a pharmacy and you're looking for natural uh, and you want to start microdosing you want to start introducing this into your daily uh, routine and habits like what to look for is, is a fantastic description and it's definitely not just cost based because that's usually where you're going to see the mass product you know the like you said ratio takes a year so that that's mm -hmm. going to be a far rarer product source than this of throughput type of product so that's awesome of course, of course and you know we've got to start somewhere so I, i've got no issue with the fact that my slated grain has been sold but now we're starting to see uh, consumers being aware of it and manufacturers moving over to a better product. So, uh, you know, we, we, we learn in the process and you develop these tools and this toolkit gets bigger. So, you know, we've got to start somewhere. The cannabis industry started somewhere. Now look at it. It's thriving and it's got all of the regulations behind it. So hopefully mushrooms will get there as well in time. Awesome. Awesome. So Reishi, Reishi is a good one. Uh, Reishi is one of my favorites. Reishi is actually what got me into the world of fungi. And it's because I, here in the Eastern Cape, I have quite a few forests all around me and this mushroom grows wild in this area. So it's the Ganoderma fungus and we get various different types. The main one here is called Ganoderma astrafricanum. We get about six different native varieties that grow in our forest. And this fungus is game a game changer it's been utilized for over 2000 years around the world it's heralded as one of the most amazing medicinal mushrooms it's actually the most studied herbal medicine in the world billions and billions of dollars pumped into this mushroom um to study its benefits and the the research is just extraordinary now it's mainly an, an all-rounder it's a good tonic for uh, various different organs in the body helping with quite a few different things. So I'm going to break them down. So first and foremost is the immune system. So it can really help to drastically improve the intelligence of our various immune systems inside of the body, uh, help increase white blood cell count, macrophage activity, killer cell count, like we, we spoke about. Um, it also has anti-cancer properties. So firstly, it can spur on apoptosis, which is the scheduled destruction of cancerous cells. But it can also be utilized as an adjuvant with chemotherapy. So if you are on chemo and you're having side effects like nausea and low immune system and uh, low energy, this mushroom can drastically increase that. Um, it can help uh, with that. We also see a little bit of heart health benefits, so helping with cholesterol and um, hypertension. Uh, you know, just in general, cardiovascular disease. Everyone knows cardiovascular disease is one of the biggest killers. It's it's not great, and this mushroom can really help increase uh, heart health. Actually, helping rebuild heart cells, helping to strengthen the uh, the, the artery walls, um, and also dropping cholesterol levels, like we spoke about. So, those are just three examples. There's also liver benefits for the liver. Um, it can help um, detox the liver. Uh, it uh, helps to rebuild liver cells. Um, and then lastly, there's also some blood sugar benefits there for diabetes. Now, these are just five of like the most the, 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 the most well-known benefits. There's also some other ones like anxiety and stress. There's some research behind it, but we've always we've got better things that we could recommend for that. This is just a good all round if you're looking to get uh, optimal health and well-being. We call it radiant health. Like, you know, that health where you're shining and you're looking good and you, you're just feeling good. This mushroom can help to get that. Um, and it's world famous for a reason. So I would really encourage everyone, if you haven't tried this mushroom yet, to give it a bash because it's really great. And if you can harvest it in the forest yourself, it's even better because then you can make your own medicine out of it. And I'll touch on that in a second, how to do that. So there's also Lion's Mane. Now, Lion's Mane has very quickly become our absolute biggest seller. Um, and I think it's because a lot of people are struggling with mental health lately. Now, this mushroom can help dramatically improve our mental scape. 
So it's got these two chemicals inside of it called hericinones and irinocenes. And these two chemicals are quite interesting because they're, they're quite unique. They can pass the blood brain barrier and spur on something called nerve growth factor. Now nerve growth factor is responsible for reconnecting neural system synapses and helping to uh, resheath the uh, myelin around our axons, um, just helping with nervous system health in general. So what that means is that it can help with um, if you have an accident and you have peripheral nerve damage or things as serious as like Alzheimer's and dementia. There's also research going into for that, actually stripping amyloid plaque from our nervous system, which is a, a telltale sign of uh, Alzheimer's. Um, there's also everyday benefits as well. So you don't have to just take it if you're in cognitive decline, if you're struggling. You can also take it just to improve focus and memory and mental clarity. Um, it's really good for helping just get the brain working optimally. Uh, they call it a neurotropic. Um, so it's really good for that. And definitely the research is showing that. Um, there is some research. I know a lot of uh, parents uh, are looking for something that can help with ADHD. There's some research around lion's mane for ADHD, which is quite exciting as well. Just helping people focus a lot better. So it's a great mushroom for for helping with uh, for helping with mental clarity with the mind. So reishi more for all body, lion's mane for the mind, and cordyceps for the body. So this is a very cool one. Cordyceps is one of those entomopathogenic fungi that we spoke about earlier, the ones that go in and they latch themselves into an insect and they make the insect climb up a tree, bite its mandibles down, and it makes a, 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 um, a fruiting body come out of its head, drop its spores, and the whole colony gets infected. It's pretty graphic, pretty gruesome. <laughs> but the cordyceps that we have is not grown on insects. Um, it's grown on um, on vegan alternatives, on rice, and then it actually makes the fruiting body and then the fruiting body is harvested. So the rice and the mycelium is left. Uh, it's just the fruiting body that we want. Now, this spe the specific species that we use is called Cordyceps militaris. It's a very strong variety that's for physical performance. So helping boost energy levels, helping with lean muscle mass development, uh, so people that exercise, it can actually help to drop weight and increase muscle tone. Um, it can increase for men testosterone production, which is a big one, because as we age, we start to produce less and less testosterone. It can really help to ramp that up. And then uh, sexual drive, libido, it's just a good one for, for that physical body to help with fatigue and physical performance. Um, that chemical that we spoke about is adenosine triphosphate. So it can actually increase that com that compound in the body. Um, it's got this chemical called cordycepin, which does that, and uh, which is quite unique. So ATP is um, correctly labeled the energy molecule. It gives energy to our cells. So this can actually help to heighten that energy uh, molecule in the body. So cordyceps is a, a fun one. If you haven't taken it, I'd also really suggest that it's uh, a good physical drive mushroom. <laughs> Okay, and then let's quickly touch on how fungi can save our world. Because this always gets people really excited about the, the fungal world. So we are currently using fungi in the world. So um, things like penicillin. Penicillin has been used for many, many, many years now. What's it going on now? Uh, 80 years um, since the war. And penicillin is made from uh, the penicillin fungus. So this is something that has been utilized for, for a long time and it's responsible for so many people uh, surviving through really bad infections. Um, it's, it's phenomenal for killing infection. We also see fungi being utilized to break down organic material. This is a very common thing. Without fungi breaking down organic material, we'd be up to our necks in, uh, in lignin and cellulose. So we have to be very, very thankful for them there. But probably the, the way that fungi make the biggest mark on our planet currently is through our foods. So a lot of people are quite surprised when I tell them lots of their foods have fungi in it. So uh, breads, for instance, um, wines, cheeses, Marmite. Everyone loves Marmite. Marmite is made from yeast, fungus, uh, even things as serious as chocolates. I mean, yeah, if you like chocolate, I love chocolate. Um, every single chocolate that you've put into your mouth has come in contact with fungi in order to um to activate that theobromine and um 
in give chocolate its taste, it needs to be fermented. And that fungi break down the cell walls and give it its its flavor. So every single chocolate that you've eaten has come in contact with fungi, which is quite interesting. But they are so It's so fascinating because I'm going to jump in there as well because what I've seen okay. from a biotech standpoint as well is where there's a lot of work done on mammalian cell lines as well as bacterial cell lines. But fungal cell lines are starting to really shine in terms of producing certain uh, therapeutic products. So even some of these uh, next generation medicines are starting to yeah. look back to fungal uh, product methods or let's just call them host cells for the, the, the production of certain medicines. Yeah. So absolutely amazing. Yeah. It's so fascinating to know, you know how, how resourceful fungus is. And when humans start to work with fungus, how symbiotic that relationship can be for production yeah, of food, of medicine, of everything across the spectrum. Well, we're actually seeing some really good, amazing work happening on yeasts at the moment. And yeasts are quite interesting because they can produce um, uh, various amino acids, various proteins. Now, that's very cool because you can splice in different DNA to get yeast to pretty much do whatever we want. They can produce high quality food substances. They can even produce things like spider silk. So instead of harvesting silk from spiders, we can get yeast to make silk for us. Uh, the 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 options are endless. They, they're really cool. If something uh, that we utilize is a protein, we can get used yeast to make it, which is quite cool. Yeah. So yeah, fungi, uh, an awesome avenue to look into. So there are three main categories that I've sort of tried to put them into, environmental, health, and technology. So environmental is one that we can see we probably need quite quite soon because our environment is being degraded on a large scale and fungi can help to repair that damage. So a healthy soil, soil that, that we want that is quite healthy. If we take a tablespoon of that soil, it should contain about 20 meters of mycelium inside of it. Now, because of um, logging and deforestation and uh, fungicides and pesticides, we no longer see that. However, we can get back there. So uh, there are options that we can do. We could um, actually do something called a spore slurry. And the spore slurry is uh, where you can actually take a fungus, you can put it into a bucket of hot water, a mushroom, a cap, put it into a bucket of hot water with uh, molasses and stir that around, and it will drop its spores into that water molasses slurry. And you can take that to an environment and pour that bucket of water in that environment, and you can start to see more fungi start to come up. Because, like we spoke about earlier, that mycelium, that web that takes place is of paramount importance to a healthy ecosystem. So this was a study that was done in, I think, New Zealand. Um, it, they basically took a 100 square meter area and they linked up different trees and saw where those trees, how they were communicating to each other, where they interlinked through my system and every single one of those trees communicated to each other through different nodes of a mycelial network. Now, this is important because they can actually pull water to trees that need water. They can shuffle nutrients to trees that need the nutrients. And they can also protect, like we spoke about, they can eat different insects like nematodes and um, actually keep uh, different tree, invasive tree species at bay. So there's a lot of research on fungi being our being our terraformers. They can choose what grows in environments and they can actually stop nutrients from going to one tree if it doesn't like that tree in that environment. So fungi can play a huge role in improving our natural world. Also for fixing it as well. So things like um, runoff from cattle farms here in the Eastern Cape, I, there's quite a few cattle farms and the farms just run straight into the water. So river sources can be polluted. Um, just the, the effluents from the cattle sites uh, contain things like E. coli, e. coli and salmonella. So what we can start to look at is putting uh, biofilters at these cattle sites to stop uh, nutrients from the cattle site getting into the water, things like E. coli or substances like E. coli and salmonella. And it's very simple. You just take a, like a hessian bag and you grow mycelium inside of that hessian bag. And because of the interlocking mycelium, pretty much nothing can pass through there. Uh, we can also see petrochemicals, aromatic carbons being broken down. This is an amazing study by Paul Stamets that was done where they actually broke down heavy metals and uh, pathogens and carbons inside of a mound. And they got that mound back to a natural state quicker than all other researchers in that model or in that, that, um, uh, that uh, yeah, test. And then we can also look at health. So 
foods, fungi and foods can be hugely beneficial, not only because they can feed populations much quicker, we can grow fungi in a fraction of the time that it takes to grow plants. Um, so we can grow huge food sources that are also medicinal, have high protein contents. We can see uh, medicinal use, like what we're doing with our company, Ether. We've helped thousands upon thousands of people now. I think we calculated recently, we've sold now over 80,000 products, which means that people all around the country have uh, benefited from fungal medicine. Even uh, psychoactive fungi use. There's a lot of research going into psychoactive fungi for depression and for um, anxiety and stress and end of life crises. Some amazing research being conducted there. Even in South Africa, there's some new research which I can't talk too much about. But uh, yeah, some universities being uh, getting uh, SAPRA licenses in order to start cultivating and using these for research, which is quite exciting. And then. Even bees can be helped with fungi. So bees, believe it or not, go to the pharmacy every single morning and they get their medicine and they take their medicine, the pharmacy being fungi. So up until now, um, bees have been utilizing that metabolite. You know, that metabolite we spoke about at the beginning that the fungi make to break down foods. Bees can actually drink up and wick up that metabolite and they can actually uh, regulate their own immune systems. Now, What's happened with the increase in viruses and pathogens like deformed wing virus and colony collapse disorder, we start to see this huge dive for bee species. Now, in South Africa as well, here in the Eastern Cape, we see huge die off of bees from things like wax moths. And the reason being is that bees don't have the capability to regulate their own immune systems anymore because we're chopping down old growth forests, taking out woodlands. So there's not as much fungi presence in our environment. So bees can't go and get that metabolite that they need. Now, as soon as we administer fungal extracts to bees, uh, fungal extracts like we make, we can start to see huge folding uh, increases in bee lifespans, the dying off of these viruses, and bees just living overall much, much well, uh, better. So. Bees are another avenue that we could look into. Even things like technology, there's some research in mushroom leather and mushroom packaging, even mushroom bricks with the compression force that's rivaling normal bricks. Surfboards, insulation. Bentley was one of the first car companies to use a fully micro leather in one of their cars. Um, Adidas shoes that are made out of micro leather. Even things as serious as computer networking. So the study was done on my the interlocking mycelial threads present in a network, and seeing if that that interwoven nature can actually transfer um, transfer uh, information quicker than a current motherboard or current network. And the research is quite preliminary, pre preliminary at the at the moment. It's quite uh, quite uh, new. However, it's very promising to show biological networks. Instead of utilizing metals and, um, and electrodes, we can utilize nature, which could be really cool. This is very promising. Mushroom inks, mushroom insecticides, like the cordyceps fungi, instead of spraying insecticides, we can infect one, one bug and that bug can go back to its colony and infect the entire colony. We don't have to spray crops with insecticides. There's multiple avenues that we can look into. Um, yeah, let me go through. So that's basically the the, the presentation. There's uh, so many different things that we can look in. However, just before I end off, I want to quickly tell you about a story, a little bit of a, a research that I've been conducting. This is the secret. This is the very exciting secret. So for the last four years, I've been researching something really interesting, something that's never been done before. I discovered something quite interesting. So um, here in South Africa, we are, our traditional healers are very famous for their plant knowledge, their knowledge of indi un indigenous herbs. We've got thousands upon thousands and they're utilized all around the world now because of that knowledge that's come out of our traditional healer programs. Our Sangomas and Nyangas are very knowledgeable when it comes to that. And I thought to myself, okay, if they use plants, have they been using fungi? And I went and researched and I, I poked around a little bit and I found absolutely no information, no books, 
no research papers. I contacted universities. There's no journals that have been written. Absolutely no documentation of fungal use in Southern Africa. And I was blown away because I thought to myself, okay, is there no use? Do our people just not utilize them or has no one documented it yet? And Jeff, you'll be pleasantly surprised to know no one has documented it yet. Our people have been using fungi for thousands and thousands of years. Fungi is integral to various different sacred rituals um, for entheogenic use, as well as medicinal use as well. Fungi used to treat cancers and sores and immune systems and so many different things, and no one's documented it. So I set out about four years ago to start this process of documenting the indigenous use of fungi. And I've traveled all around the country and I've spoken to many, 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 many dozens of traditional healers. Um, I'm still traveling and I've just discovered the most amazing stuff. So I wanna show you some of this because it's gonna blow your mind. So as you can see, I've traveled into the highlands of Lesotho. I walked 80 kilometers where no car can go into the Lesotho mountains to go and speak to traditional healers. Hogs back the Eastern Cape, the Western Cape. I'm going at the end of this month to speak to the Khoisan people up in the Northern Cape. Um, there's so, so much knowledge. Just to give you some example, I don't wanna uh, take too much of your time, but some of our most sacred rituals, like the initiation ceremony of a boy becoming a man. This is probably his most sacred rite in his whole life, the initiation to become a man. Cannot happen, it cannot happen, unless the reishi mushroom is present. The reishi mushroom they call ispindi, and ispindi is ground up, as you can see on the right-hand side here, it's ground up and applied to the whole body after the three week period of initiation. And this is believed to give him um, luck and spiritual power to pass into manhood. This is the reishi mushroom, which like no one has written about. However, what we're trying to do with this research is marry the traditional use with the modern scientific use. So I've been writing this book called Mushroom Muti and it's the gourmet medicinal and entheogenic use of fungi in Southern African tribal people. So what we're doing is we're working with the University of the Free State, and we're checking, okay, with this reishi perhaps, is it providing some anti, uh, antibiotic, antifungal support after circumcision? Is it doing something to provide some benefit for these young boys? Is there some knowledge that's been locked away? This is just one example. I found things like psychoactive fungi being utilized, um, things like um, various fungi used as arrow poisons uh, to uh, improve uh, wound healing off the burns. The list just goes on and on and on. It's so insane, but what I wanna show you, which is gonna blow your mind, is I thought to myself, okay, if we've been utilizing fungi for thousands of years, as these people say, how far back does it go? How far back can we get it? And I thought to myself, okay, our traditional people aren't writing people. They didn't document via writing, they documented verbally. However, they also documented with paintings, rock art. And I thought to myself, okay, could I find some depiction of rock art and mushrooms in Southern Africa? Because all around the world, we've maybe only got a handful, maybe five to seven depictions of mushrooms in our rock art, uh, in Spain, in um, South America, nothing in South Africa. I researched and I researched extensively and I could not find anything. And I asked and I asked, eventually I did the same thing. I said, okay, has no one looked at this? So I contacted the university of the Witwatersrand and I requested access to their rock archives. And I kid you not, I sifted through over 200,000 images. It took me weeks and weeks and weeks. And I found the most amazing stuff. I think I found depictions of fungal artwork and I wanna show you some of them and you can let me know what you think they look like. So I've found over 70 images. However, I'm just gonna show you some of them because I gotta keep some of them for the book to get people excited. <laughs> yeah. So this one over here, I'm gonna zoom in. So this over here is called the crocodile people. Now the crocodile people are 
therianthropes in San Bushman artwork. A therianthrope is a man in transition to an animal. It's usually a trance state, a trance state that's uh, making him transform into an animal. And up until now, the research has pointed to these trance states being induced by ecstatic dance or psychoactive substances, but there's no definitive proof on psychoactive substance use. I think I've found some. So this is the crocodile people, as you can see here. And we see this man over here exalting something, holding something up into the sky. And we can see it's got a stud and this triangular form here. So I looked a little bit more and you see he's transforming into a crocodile and right here in his hand, he's holding something with a stipe that goes past his hand and a cap. What does that look like to you? Yeah. Yeah, it definitely looks like a mushroom. Also, the shaft is too small to be a depiction of a spear. So fully, I agree. Definitely. That's awesome to document this. Awesome, right? Okay, we've got some more depictions over here. We've got these people holding over here. We've even got these people over here. This is a very interesting one. This is them. This is believed to be them sitting down, these uh, Sangomas, but they're flying off. As you can see, these lines, they're flying off into something, into the space or into cosmos. And as we can see here, this man is putting something into his mouth with an inverted cap. It's got a concave cap. See that there with a stipe and a concave cap, and he's putting it here into his open mouth. So keep that in mind, that concave cap. We've also got these rabbit people over here with these long ears. These are therianthropes again, holding a stipe with a bulbous section over here. Now, this is just a hypothesis. We're writing a paper at the moment um, to verify it. These are just four of the images of over 70, with some being way more uh, realistic. But I want to show you something else that's quite interesting. So I there's these depictions and i thought to myself okay we've got to find maybe sacred use of mushrooms because if there's sacred use it means that it, mushrooms have been revered so i went and i looked and i discovered in the kalahari the khoisan bushmen have been utilizing fungi for a number of years we know this because of the kalahari truffle which they call naba and Naba is believed to be linked to one of their deities, the Thunderbird. And as the Thunderbird flies, it brings the rain and it lays its eggs being the Kalahari truffle. And these are revered because they're food source. And I thought to myself, okay, if they're immediately revering fungi at the moment, there must be more that they're revered. So one of their supreme deities is believed to come out of something called the formling. A formling is usually depicted as a white circle. And it's now been um, verified that these formlings are actually termite mounds. Um, yeah. Now, these termite mounds are believed to form life and give life. Now, I thought to myself, okay, termite mound. If, you, if you're a mycologist, you know, out of termite mounds, there are a really amazing edible fungus called termitomyces that grows out of it. It's a big edible mushroom. And if I was a hunter-gatherer, I would revere two things. I would revere something that changed my consciousness and something that fed my family, like we know they did with the Kalahari truffle. So I set out to try and find some formlings, perhaps with some mushrooms coming out of it. And I think I've found one yet. So this is a woman bending down. She's bending down with an outstretched arm to pick something up, as we can see here. And we see here a circle, a formling right underneath her to the right chair, as you can see with these four things coming out of the top with a concave cap like that. So I'm like, okay, that looks, it looks a bit abstract. Can I find hard hitting proof? This is just a little bit of information. Can I find hard hitting proof? There's something here where the cap hasn't unfurled yet and these caps have unfurled. So let's check a little bit more. So as you can see, this is the Tomatomyces mushroom. It's got this long stipe over here with this cap and the cap is usually bulbous until it forms out and it makes this concave section over here. See that? Yeah. It goes in. So keep this in mind, this long tail that goes into the termite mound and a bulbous cap on the top. So I went to one of the most sacred sites. This is the, um, the white shaman of Brunberg. This is a very sacred site. And I was thinking to myself, okay, Let's look at the sacred site. And I was looking at it. This is the white shaman over here. It's supposed to be a, a, a Sangoma that's painted in white with white clay. And just to the right, we see this person over here holding something. 
So I wanted to get a better depiction. So I found some artwork over here with the better depiction. So as you can see, I've got this bulbous cap, this long stipe running down it. And I thought to myself, that looks just like Termitomyces. It's got this cap with a black umber, a, a sharp point at the top of its cap, as you can see here. It's thinner and then becomes bulbous with this dark brown black section that goes down into the termite mound. I thought to myself, why on earth would they put a fungus? Because this looks like a Termitomyces mushroom to me. Why would they put this next to the most one of the most sacred artworks in Brandberg at the White Shaman if it wasn't important? Could our ancient ancestors here in Southern Africa have not just revered mushrooms or used mushrooms, but also revered them? Could our ancient ancestors have utilized fungi long before we ever thought that they did? I think they did. I don't know what you think. But no, this is just... awesome. I love this. I mean, it's this journey through history and through time. And it's like, when you think of Africa, you don't think of traditional fungal use. But after watching this yeah. segment, it, it makes you start to question and see like how indigenous knowledge systems have been, you know, it's so important to showcase it, to, to, to create these yeah. hypotheses yeah. and to like raise it as a, as a valid point for consideration because I absolutely love this. It's like, this is what science is for is to look at it and history paired with science is such a fascinating topic. Definitely, man. Yeah, it's it's a it's an amazing uh, field of research that I'm in. I love what I do. I absolutely love what I do. And this is only like a small segment of what the book is going to consist of. Um, so what I'm hoping to do is try and get people excited about mushrooms, get them to, to see how amazing they are. So we do that through our company, through providing medicine, but then also with free forages and free talks, uh, we've got free books that you can download off of our website. It's all just about getting people excited. And then hopefully my book will be out quite soon. Um, and that's what we do, man. Awesome. Hopefully we can make a bit of a Awesome. Kellen, this was amazing. It was super diverse. Like you went from you went from the history, its previous uses, through the different mushrooms, through the different molecules, yep. through the extraction, through it's really been super diverse and super <laughs> I love it. Uh, so I love that we were able to take this time to capture this passion uh to to highlight this because I think it's such a great educational piece. And with with mushrooms really coming into bloom in South Africa in terms of people having an active interest. I think this was amazing and I'm looking forward to more discussions in future where we go into specific, uh, we drill down into certain verticals because this was ultra, uh, ultra, ultra well spread. I mean, I did not expect it to be this comprehensive as well. I saw parts of it at the presentation, but we didn't have the yeah. time to do it proper justice. And I really think we've given it good justice today because it's been like a good hour and 20 minutes of going through Thanks, the content. Man. I really enjoyed it. And what I'll do as well is I'm going to link up all your contact information, the website. So anyone who's really watched it and been through this journey with us for the, for the last hour, almost and a half, like <laughs> it's just the beginning. Like there's so much good work out there. You mentioned Paul Stamets. There's so much interesting activities in the world of mycology yeah. and functional mushrooms, medicinal mushrooms. It's just so interesting. We, we've, we've spoken in the past about psychedelic mushrooms, but it's just part of it. I mean, there's so much, so much that we can dive into. There's, there's the actual chemical compounds that we could look at. There's psychedelic use. There's, uh, there's just that it's endless. We can actually look at extraction because uh, that's a whole topic just on its own. Uh, so yeah, I would love to, to do this again sometime. No, awesome. Excellent. I, I have to say thank you for making the time sharing this passion. I mean, it, it's infectious to see how much, how much energy you have for this subject, uh, how much time you've put into it, the fact that you went and looked through 200,000 images to, to, to kind of uh, hypothesize and go through traditional yep. use, because we know it has to be there, because let's be honest, uh, it's been there in the past, and we've seen this through multiple cultures, and fundamentally, yep. we know that uh, we've co-evolved with, with fungal mycelium, with mushrooms throughout yep. our lives, so it's definitely an active part of, of our development as species. I have to say thank you once again, Cullen. I'm going to share everything. And uh, thank you so much for coming on today to share this. Much love, man. Thank you so much, Jeff. Appreciate it, man. Awesome.